So I'm up here again. <laughs> I got I got to start off by playing the blame game. First I'm going to I'm going to have to blame Rick. Okay? <laughs> he is a gracious pastor to allow me to come up here to share his pulpit is no small thing. I think it's wonderful the fact that he can look at others and say you may have something and you may need to fan it in a flame. So he gives you this opportunity to come up here and do these kind of things. So I'm going to blame him for that and I thank you for, for sharing your pulpit. Jared said it well. It, it, this is probably his most enjoyable part of his job is probably getting up here and talking to you. Now the, the rest of the people I'd like to blame is you all. That's right. I, the last time I was up here, you know who you are. You all encouraged me. Now if, if you didn't like what I had to say, you shouldn't encourage people. <laughs> You ought to just keep that to yourself. If you were just being nice, take the lesson. Don't say anything nice, because I might come back up again. <laughs> so, all right, let me, let me just pray us up. God, I just, I thank you. God, I thank you for just being the creator and awesome God that you are. God, I pray that you would just speak through me today. God, use your words through my heart. And God, I pray that you would just break us and just let your words sink deep into our heart where we need to hear it the most. I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. All right, today we are in John, John chapter 1. I, I can't even get through four whole verses. I'm, this is like three and a half verses. I even cut John off. I, th if you're thinking this is going to be a short sermon, it, well, I, I try. <laughs> uh, it's kind of a porcupine sermon. I've got a lot of points to make. So if you've got your Bible, turn to John 1. We're going to start off in 1 through 4. And this is really where I'm going to stay. I'm going to kind of play Bible auction man again and throw some other verses at you, but I'm going to primarily be right here in John 1. Let's start by reading it. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made, and in Him was life. And yes, I did cut that verse in half, and there's a purpose in that. So, there's an obvious point here. If, if, if you want to know what the Gospels are saying, the, the obvious point is this. They all kind of have the same theme. They all are identifying who Christ is. And that is this. They're saying He is both God and Savior. Now that, that's an obvious point to make, right? He's God and Savior. But it's controversial nonetheless. You know, these writers had the same problems that we have today. You will have a lot of people tell you that Jesus is not God and Savior. In fact, uh, we probably have more people saying that than we have saying the opposite. Right? So John had that problem to deal with. And Time Magazine says this today. He says, Jesus is the most written about person in all of human history. Time Magazine says this. That's pretty amazing to me. Not only do people, not only do they deny that he is God, they will actually deny that he even existed, despite the fact that he is the most written about person in all of human history. I find that amazing. There are other writers in the Gospels. Paul, he's not a gospel writer, but he said this about Jesus. While we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Matthew, in the beginning of Matthew, he says, they, they will call the baby Emmanuel, which means God with us. In Acts, you see Luke saying this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucify, both Lord and Christ. There, there is nothing unclear about that. that. That is plain English. Yet so many people will come to you today and say, Jesus is not God. He can't, he can't be God. He can't be a Savior. In fact, you know, a lot of times they'll come to you and say, well, he's a moral person. He's just a moral teacher. Well, why is this so important? Why do we stake the claim that he is Savior and God? It's this. Only God can save you. If he was just another man, we wouldn't have a Savior. Only God can save you. You have people today, you know, the influence of Dan Brown and the Da Vinci Code. You'll have people just coming up with all kinds of conspiracy theories. The basic logic tells you if you want to know something about somebody, you go close to the source and find out what that person was about. We have many writers. They had all the opportunity in the world to say that he wasn't God and Savior, but they didn't. Every one of them, every gospel, every message in the Bible says the same thing. He is God and Savior. Yet, we have so many people today, far removed, 2,000 years, that are still telling us he couldn't have been God and Savior. But here it is. And I think there's more proof in, in John. I think right here in, the, in, in John 1, 4, he starts off in verse 1, he says, in the beginning, and then at the end of verse 2, he says, in the beginning. Now, I've taught you all about the, 
doctrine of repeatability. That is basically when, when somebody says something once, it's pretty important, but if they say it a second time, it's really important. And I know most men in here, when your wife says something the second time, you hear, right? <laughs> we never have to hear it a third time. <laughs> All right, so he says it twice here. So what is he trying to say? I think he's, he sums it up for us in verse 3. He says, through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. He is tying Jesus to the creation story. In the beginning. Sounds familiar. Genesis starts off, in the beginning. He says it twice here in John. He's directly tying Jesus to the, to the creation story. Well, why is this important? Well, Jesus was never created. He is creator. There's a big difference. It all goes back to the whole theme here. He is God and Savior. He was creator. He was not created. Let me find myself here. This is, there's another big point that, I, you know, I went to public school and I, I come across some theological words. Um, <laughs> and if I can get these words, you guys can too, all right? Uh, th there's something that I came across. I, it was repeated several times in some of the things I read. The authors want to tell you about Jesus' eternality. Now, if you can say that in a sentence this week and say it to somebody, I'll be really impressed. Basically, what that eternality, Jesus' eternality is this. He always existed. He is pre-existent. He always was wasing. Let me say that again in case I lost you. He always was wasing. Uh, now, <laughs> it's bad grammar, but it's good theology. There was never a time that Jesus did not exist. He always existed. Another point about this is all things were made through him. There is nothing you can smell, taste, touch, or see that Jesus didn't have a part in creating. That's pretty powerful. That's pretty amazing. Jesus even backed John up on this statement. He said, he was talking to a bunch of religious leaders, and he said to them, before Abraham was born, I am. Before Abraham was born, he even speaks to his eternality. He says it right to him. And then a lot of, a lot of people question, they say, well, what did, what did Jesus do before the creation of the world? What was he doing? And I came across a quote I thought was kind of funny. Augustine used to say, well, he was creating hell for people that would ask, ask such questions. But <laughs> I thought that was funny. But uh, we know a little bit of what he was doing because this verse tells us here. Uh, Jesus' words, he says this. He says, now, now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. Again, before the world began, what was Jesus doing? He was sharing in his Father's glory. There was perfect fellowship and perfect relationship in the Trinity before the world began. That's one thing we know he was doing before the creation of the world. This brings me to another point that I think John is trying to make here. The Word was with God and the Word was God. Now, how can you be with something and be that something at the same time? Well, this is another big theological term. It's called the Trinity, and everybody's heard it. Now, if you can't understand this, you're in good company. <laughs> uh, many Christians stumble with this. I, I think Charles Spurgeon said it well once. He said, if you deny the Trinity, you lose your soul. If you try to explain it, you lose your mind. <laughs> so I, I, I'm not going to try to explain it today. I, that's really not the point of my sermon. But it, is, it backs up the proof that God, Jesus is both God and Savior. It's not a new idea. If you look in Genesis, let us make God, or let, sorry, let us make man in our own image. Who's us? Who's our? That's the Trinity. John's not introducing a new doctrine when he says he was with God and was God. It's a doctrine that's been here for a long time. That second part of that statement, the word was God. That's another theological term. I can't escape these theological terms. I'm going to preach on John. I've got to bring up big words that, that are hard to understand. This talks about his incarnation. And I, I've heard somebody preach this once or explain this once to kids, and I thought it was kind of funny. He said, the incarnation, you've got to think about it like chili. He says, that, you know, there's regular chili, and then there's chili con carne. And everybody knows chili con carne is with chili with meat. Now, there's regular chili, which, you know, it's okay, but then there's chili con carne with meat. And every man going to heaven likes meat, right? Yeah. <laughs> so there's something that you can't reveal with the regular chili that the, the chili with meat can reveal. There's something special. This is redneck theology, in case you're wondering. 
the, the, basically what he's saying is the incarnation. John says, this is God with meat, or God in the flesh. And again, it goes back, why is this important? Why do we care? Because again, only God can save you. If he was just another man, if he was just another moral person, there's no salvation in this. It's very important. We have to identify and realize that he is both God and Savior. This is really the heart of my sermon. In the beginning was the Word. He says this three times in John. Now you can find seminary papers miles long about the Word. The Word is, this phrase is just all over the place. If you go on the internet, this is just a very talked about topic. Just two simple words, the Word. Um, I'm going to kind of give you the, I guess, what the expert opinions are, and then I'm going to get dangerous and kind of give you my opinion. Um, the Word. This is, this is not part of the sermon. There are many people that will come knocking on your door, namely the Jehovah's Witnesses, and they will try to tell you that this, the word, is translated wrong, and it should say a word. Now, it's not that way in the Greek, and it's not that way in your English Bible. And again, that would just make us another religion. If it was translated a word, it would just be a simple man. We know that the word refers to Jesus because later in verse 17, he connects it for us. John emphatically says, this is Jesus I'm talking about. So when you see the word, you can, you can pop that out in your mind. You can read it. In the beginning was Jesus. And Jesus was God. Now, that's an interesting thing that you can do that. John is trying to really just hammer in the idea that Jesus and God are one and the same. He is God and Savior. Now, let me just back up for a minute. There's two, there's two things that the expert will, will say about this. The Word. What is John doing? Now, back in the Jewish culture, there was, there was a thought that the Word is how God created the world. And the Word was also how He revealed Himself. So when, when John does this, it's kind of a, it's a play on words in a way. He's really talking to the Jews in a sense that they understand. They get it. When they say, in the beginning was the Word, they're okay with that. Everything's fine with them. They, they're okay until he starts connecting it to Jesus. They don't make anybody mad in the Jewish culture until he connects it to Jesus. And in the same way, he's also speaking to the Greeks. There was a fellow by the name of Heraclitus back then, and uh, he, he used to teach to the Greeks that there was this impersonal force, this thing called the Logos, or maybe it was the Logos. I'm not sure how to pronounce it. But what it meant is basically all reality is based on knowing more about the Logos, or the, where it translates the Word. And if you know more about the Word, somehow your soul was better in touch with reality. Well, John does something here. He, he takes something out of the Jewish culture and he takes something out of the Greek culture at the same time and he says, what you're all looking for, what you're all writing books about, what you're all trying to discover is this. It's the Word. It's Jesus. He's pointing them all to the same place. I think this is an interesting point that John's doing. He, he can take this and he unites two different groups of people. And if Jesus can't unite us, who can? So. so, there's other things that you might find interesting about the word. In our culture, it's very important to us to have words. This is, I'm getting into my opinion now. I'm, We've left the experts now. We're, we're getting dangerous. When you look around in our culture, we do things like we get married. We exchange wedding vows. We use words to exchange our vows. When we elect a president, we have a swearing in. When somebody joins the military, we have a swearing in. When lawyers become lawyers, they have an oath they have to take. Doctors, they take a Hippocratic oath. Kids, we start them off in school with the Pledge of Allegiance. We use words to signify very special or important events in our life. Words have a very special and important place in our culture. Some of the most famous words, we're, we live so close to Washington, D.C., I, I think it's really great that we can go down to D.C. and we can find words that have been spoken throughout history. And most of you recognize words. And I, For example, this. Ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. Who is that? Wow, that's a great audience. That's right, John F. Kennedy. These were, everybody knows these words. It's, it's like it, it took a life of its own when he said them. What about this? Never in the field of human conflict was so much owed 
by so many to so few. A little bit tougher. Anybody know who that is? Winston Churchill. But you've probably heard it. You probably just didn't know who it was. All right. Democracy is the government of the people, by the people, for the people. Abraham Lincoln. That's right. Abraham Lincoln. All right. All right. Early to bed, early to rise makes a man healthy, wealthy, and wise. Benjamin Franklin. Or Winnie the Pooh, if you're in my house. <laughs> it's a hotly contested subject in our house. So who said it first? We're not really sure. Uh, <laughs> so. so words play a very important part. You, you can see by this example that, you know, words are something we remember. They, they stick with us. They, they live and have a life of their own. They influence cultures. They influence governments. They influence how we do things. We signify special events with how we use them. So when John says Jesus is the Word, I think it's very important. I think he's really trying to say something to us. All right. So this brings me to a point where I just really got to studying hard. I really got to wondering, you know, a well-placed word can have such a significance in somebody's life. Well, what about the opposite of a not so well-placed word? What about negative words? What about the influence of that? Now, we don't necessarily record negative words. For example, some of the darkest moments in our, our country's history, if you can think back to Pearl Harbor, there were many conversations that took place before Pearl Harbor happened. Words set things into motion that devastated the lives of many people. You can think back to 9-11. There's an obvious example. I can't, can't pass that one up. There was plotting that had to go on. There was words that had to take place that set off some of the most significant events in all of human history. Well, I think the worst words I think you could ever find and the most devastating words are actually written in the Bible. I want you to think of this. The implications of this are huge. You will not surely die. Who's that? Satan. That's right. The beginning of the fall of man started with the words with words, a lie entered into the world. And all of human history has been changed as a result of that. We're no longer naked and happy with our father in the garden. And some of us are probably happy about that. <laughs> Am I allowed to mention nudity up here? I don't know. <laughs> Rick might not be asking me back next time. <laughs> all right. So Words are important. So does the Bible say anything about our use of speech, our use of language? Well, it's interesting. I started studying this. I started really trying to figure it out. And I dug deep and I found this. 137 times the use of our tongue is mentioned in the Bible. 123 times the use of our lips. 308 times the use of our mouth. 848 times the use of our speech, how we speak or are spoken to. Wow. That kind of rocked me a little bit when I started studying this. I thought, wow, the Bible really does have something to say about how we use our words and how they're important. I mean, that's phenomenal. And I started thinking about the fact that even in our salvation process, what do we do when we have kids here for VBS and Awanas? What do we do? We do admit, believe, and confess. The ABCs of becoming a Christian, right? How can you admit or confess, for that matter, without using words? Our words signify who we are. Our words are very special. So calling Jesus the Word is a pretty big deal. I, really, you could make the argument you can't believe without saying something as well, but I'll just leave it at two out of three of these. You have to use words. Um, confession. That's a beautiful word. I love the word confession. Now, a lot of people think of confession, they get, it's just a negative connotation. You think to yourself, Oh, well, I, I have to confess my sins, and it's just very negative. Well, no, you don't just confess your sins. You confess that Jesus is God and Savior with your words. That is probably the bigger of the two confessions that you can make. There's lots of confessions you can make. The biggest confession of all is who Jesus is. John later, he makes his confession in this same chapter. Or John, John the Baptist, that is. He says, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. What a confession. Man, he just nailed it in that statement right there. He just said, look, there he is, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. You will not surely die. Now all of a sudden we've already progressed to the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Probably the most famous confession of all is Peter's. 
we have an entire church built around his confession. The Roman Catholic Church is built on the confession of Peter. You see, Jesus was kind of, he was coming up to his posse, and he says to him, who do people say I am? And some of his disciples, well, you're that crazy bug-eating cousin of yours, John the Baptist. Or you're Elijah, or you're Jeremiah. You're just a prophet, is what some people are saying. But then he turns to Peter and he says, who do you say I am? And Peter, unflinching, without question, again, he had every opportunity to say something different here, but he didn't. He says, you are the Christ. You are the son of the living God. Without flinching, he said this. Can you think of any other confessions that we make with our words that are any that could even compare to this? Of all the words that you've ever spoken over the course of your life, what compares to your confession of who Jesus is? That's a big question. Earlier I said Time Magazine wrote that the most written about person in human history is Jesus. You know what they're all writing about? What the primary subject of all these writers are writing about? Who is Jesus? That's what you'll find. You go out and look at all these words, everybody wants to know, what's the answer to this question? Who is Jesus? There is no other question that you can answer in your lifetime that is, has more significance than that question. And we do it with words. We answer with the words. We, prof we confess them with our words. What does Jesus say about words? Well, Jesus had a few things to say. The good man brings up good things out of the good stored up in his heart. And the evil man brings evil out of the evil stored up in his heart. For out of the overflow of his heart, his mouth speaks. His mouth speaks. He uses words to say who he is. You know what this says? You can't hide who you are. Your words eventually are going to give away who you are. Your words are the most telling thing about a person. The very nature of who you are is revealed in what you say. So you think you can hide behind all these layers of something. But you're not. In all honesty, everybody knows who you are because your words reveal it to us. So it makes an interesting question. What have you said lately? What have you revealed about yourself by the things that you say lately? Based on this criteria, based on the fact that I'm trying to tell you that God is both Jesus and Savior, what did he say? What came out of his mouth? Well, that John the Baptist, crazy John the Baptist that was eating bugs, Herod had put him in prison. He makes this great confession. He says, here's the Lamb of God. Takes away the sins of the world. Now he's in prison. And now he's starting to have doubts. He's wrestling. And he's, maybe he's running out bugs to eat in prison. And Herod's not treating him too nice. And he sends his disciples out. He says, go ask Jesus. Go ask him. Is he the one or, or should we be waiting for another? I'm, I'm really not sure. I'm in prison now. And I'm running out of bugs to eat. So this is what Jesus says back to him. He says, report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor. What did Jesus do? He raised the dead with his, with his words. He spoke and people came out of the grave. Man, I wish I could have been there for that. Wow, that would have been something. I'd, I just once I'd like to go to a funeral and walk out with the person that we went to go pay respects <laughs> to and see him come with us. I mean, that would just, that would turn your world upside down, wouldn't it? But there's a big point that I think he's trying to make. Jesus' words bring life. What are our words doing? Do we bring life with our words? Do we raise the dead with our words? Are we, are we bringing life? Or are we destroying it by the things that we say? Very important question. This is, this is really the point of the, the last part of John here. I'm, in him was life. We have to have new life with him. We have to have words that have life. I want you to think with me for a minute at the Great Commission. Jesus is about to leave the earth for the, he's done. He's, he's come, he's done his job, he saved us. And now he's leaving his disciples and he leaves these words. These are the last words he speaks to them. He says, then Jesus came to them and he said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and then of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded to you. And surely I am with you to the very end of the age. How do you teach? How do you make disciples without using words? Do you realize what he's saying here? This is, I, I just, this, there's a beautiful thing here. Not only does he command us to go and make disciples and teach them, he invites us to do it. 
He gives us permission. He's sharing this with us. That's a pretty big thing. Can you think of a time when you were young and your father or your dad, some of us may not have had a good dad that would do this, but you can think of a time when you were young and your dad would let you be with him on a project and you got to do something with him. How cool was that to be with your dad and to be a part of what he was doing? Ingrid always shared this story with me when we were dating. When she was a little girl, her dad would pull up into the cul-de-sac and he was getting home from work and he'd open the door and she'd hop in and she'd get on his lap and she'd steer the car back into the driveway. And now her feet couldn't reach the pedals or anything, but you know, that just had to be the best feeling. You get to share something with your dad. This is what he's doing here in the Great Commission. He's giving you the permission. He's giving you the honor, the privilege to share in life-changing work. You get to go out and actually share with people who Jesus is. He could have done it himself, but he didn't. He allowed us to be a part of this. How great is that? To be sharing something with your dad. But some of us, some of us are scared to get in the car and let sit on dad's lap and steer the car. Some of us, we start coming up with excuses of why we don't do this. Some of us say, well, well, I'm a man of action. Actions speak louder than words, right? <laughs> I really question this statement. I, 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 ser sincerely, in some context, yes, I agree. Actions do speak louder than words in the sense that when I ask my kids to do something and they obey me without any words, wow, it pleases me. I mean, <laughs> How many parents can <laughs> relate to that? And I think in the same way, when God speaks to us and we do something and we don't complain and we just go and do it, simple acts of obedience, I think they please God. But I don't believe this statement is necessarily true. And here's why I don't believe it's true. Jesus says, I tell you the truth, anyone who gives you a cup of water in my name because you belong to Christ will certainly not lose his reward. How do you give a cup of water to somebody in somebody's name without using words? How do you do that? Well, it's kind of just a meaningless cup of water if you're not really saying who it's from or in whose name it is. I think Jesus wants us to do both. I don't think he wants us just to have actions. I think he wants us to have actions with words. Yes, actions speak very loud, but think how much louder they speak when we use words to go with them. Now, there's another extreme to this. And this is me, to some extent, for many years. All talk and no action. I think this is where the phrase, practice what you preach, came from. You know, I, many of us, we know the vocabulary. We know the words. You're thinking to yourself, man, I know scripture. If I have to quote it, I can, I can quote it. In fact, you're so full of words, but you don't have any actions to go with it. You have done nothing. I think it's very sad our pastor went on a mission trip by himself. We, we as a church, there's a lot of people in here. Some of us could have gone, me included. I'm not singling anybody out. I'm certainly in this mix myself. So Jesus even had something to say about people that, that have all talk and no action. He was talking to a bunch of religious types, and he said, You diligently study the scriptures because you think that by them you possess eternal life. These are the scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to, you refuse to come to me to have life. Again, there's that, that word life. Man, I love that word. You've got to have new life. You think that by knowing the scriptures, it's going to save you. Jesus didn't ask you to come to a book. He asked you to come to a person. It's a big difference. Some of us have the vocabulary, but we have no action to go with it. Some of us are missing the point. He wants us to have new life. I'm looking at the baby. Jared and Aaron just had their baby Friday night. It kind of reminded me. This is new life. As I'm sitting there watching Ingrid hold this baby, and I'm thinking to myself, it's a new beginning. It, you start all over. That's what new life is like. You can't have the words without starting over by putting away the old self and putting on the new self. You got to have new life. Jesus wants you to come to him and have new life and not just words. What's at stake here? Well, I think something big is at stake here. Why don't we 
get on our Father's lap? Why are we so concerned? Why are we so scared to share these words of life with people? We have the opportunity to share life-changing words. The most important words you could ever say to somebody is, who is Jesus? Yet we don't do it. What's at stake? Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. His words will live forever. What's at stake? Eternity is at stake. There's a lot riding on what you have to say. A huge amount. Now, I'm looking out. I don't really see any old people out here. Waldo's almost there. He just turned 90 years young. <laughs> He's about, when you get old, if theoretically we ever had old people in this, this congregation, old people have the most influence, I think, in my opinion, than anyone else. You may think that young people aren't listening to you, but I think they are. I think you have the words that can change the lives the most. You are sitting in, the, in a position of power with your age. You can change the course of your family in a way that no one else can by just simply asking them, who do you think Jesus is? I bet you could open a whole new set of conversations with your loved ones just by asking that question. We need to get into the battle. Too many of us are leaving the battlefield. We're not brave. We just, we're too concerned. We're too scared to sit and steer the car with our dad. But Jesus says this in Corinthians, or Paul says this in Corinthians, sorry. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. How do you demolish an argument without words? Smith and Wesson? <laughs> I'd love to do that, but that's not what it says. It says, those aren't our weapons. The weapons are our words. What we say to somebody matters. It's very important. We can demolish arguments. And who do we demolish against? It says, against the knowledge, or those who set themselves up against the knowledge of God. Does anybody fit that category in your mind? Do you know anybody that sets themselves up and who's so opposed to God? I bet everybody. I bet you've got people in your family that are opposed to God. What do you use? Words. We go into battle. Too many of us have left the battle. Some of us didn't even get into the battlefield. We're just giving up ground to the enemy. We're just letting him take it without even, not even a word. We're walking off the battlefield. Some of us need to get back into the battle. Some of us need to take these words. We need to start taking back ground. Today, go back to the enemy. Take back some of the ground he's taken. It's not his. There are two options of what you will hear when you leave this world. Two things that Jesus could say to you. First is this. I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Can you imagine what that's going to feel like? For the first time in your life, you hear the lips of Jesus, or you look at his face, and he says to you, depart me from me, I never knew you. With words, you're going to enter the kingdom. When you leave this world, you're going to hear you're going to see Jesus for the first time. One of the words he's going to say to some group of people is this. The other group, he's going to say this. Well done, good and faithful servant. Can you imagine how that's going to feel? Man, come and share with my master's happiness. Can you imagine? This is the prize that we're living for. To hear, to look at the face of Jesus. To see his lips move and say, well done, good and faithful servant. You're going to see the words coming out of his mouth when you leave this world. How cool is that? How amazing is that going to be? Incidentally, he's already told us what everybody's response will be. Whether he says, apart from me, you evildoer, or whether he says, well done, good and faithful servant. He's going to say the same, the same response is going to happen from all of us. Romans 14, 11, every knee will bow before him, and every tongue you're going to say it with words. Oprah, one day, is going to say it with words. <laughs> Tiger Woods, one day, is going to say it with words. Every person is going to say it. They're going to say it with their tongue. They're going to confess. Just like Peter confessed, Jesus, you are God and Savior. They're going to confess it. You're either going to do it now, or you're going to do it later. You're either going to hear the last words out of Jesus' lips when you get there, and he's going to say, get away. Or you're going to hear the first of many words. And he's going to say, enter into my happiness. 
Which one do you want to be? Which, which words do you long to hear from the lips of Jesus? Which words are you living to hear for? Now, I may have stirred some of you up a little bit this morning. I may have gotten you to the point where you've said, said to yourself, well, I've never made that confession in my life. I've, I, I don't know what you're talking about. I, you know, I'm still trying to figure out who, who this Jesus character is. You know, that's, that's, that's a tough one for me to swallow. Yeah, those guys that knew him, they believed him. That's easy for him. They knew him. It was easier for them, but yet they still had to face the challenge. They still had to look people in the eye and say, without flinching, this is Christ. This is God the Savior. They were willing to confess that all the way to their death. Now, nobody's going to shoot you for not confessing it today, but we invite you to come up today and make it public. This is kind of a silly thing we Baptists do. We have an invitation at the end. We, we like to share these things with everybody because it's a big deal to us. Because if you can confess now, we know what words Jesus will have for you when you get to heaven. And that's a big deal. We want to celebrate with you. Some of you are just, you're just kind of, you're at the point where you realize, man, I've left the battlefield. I know what he's talking about. I have not been bold. I have not been brave. I've been scared to use my words. I'm not on the battlefield. I'm running from the field. And it's time to start taking back ground that we've been giving up. So today we're going to ask you to come forward. No matter what the Lord's speaking to you about, Lord, we want to pray with you. We want to help you get into the battle. We want to help you make a confession. If you haven't made a confession, we'd like to know about it. You don't have to do it here and you don't have to do it now. Just tell us at some point. We'd like to know. It matters to us what words you use. I'm going to pray for us. Father, I, I, just, I just pray that these words sink deep in our heart. God, even, even in my soul right now, Lord, I know I, I rarely live there. God, I want to be sitting in your lap, steering the car with you. God, I want to share in this experience of changing people's lives, giving them words that, that, that will change them forever. God, that the... This is the most important thing I could ever do in my life, but yet I shy away from it. God, make me, use me, prepare me to be somebody that can go out into the battlefield and not be scared to run. Lord, I pray this in your name. Amen.